Good evening, everyone. Or maybe I should rather say good evening for some of us and good morning uh, for the others. Welcome to the online meeting, lecture and conversation with Rebecca Solnit, which is a part of Zachenta's online program. My name is Magdalena Komornicka. I'm an art historian and curator in Zachenta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw, Poland. I'm more than happy to host this meeting today and together with Agata Sikora, cultural studies essayist, author of the book, Liberty, Equality, Violence, What We Don't Want to Tell One Another, to enter into the conversation with our guest, Rebecca Solnit, whom I will introduce with more details in the moment. Our, our meeting will be divided into two parts. After my introduction, Rebecca Solnit will conduct a lecture titled The Personalist Political, 21st Century Versions. Lecture about feminism as an analyse of power and powerlessness, from the dinner table to the bedroom, to the boulevard, to the parliament. After the lecture, we will get into the conversation with our guest, and I would like to invite you to join us, to share your thoughts, give comments, and ask questions through our Facebook chat and on our YouTube channel. If there will, uh, if there will be time, Rebecca will answer some of your questions at the end of uh, our meeting. There are two main contexts of today's meeting. First one, is Joanna Spietrowska recent solo exhibition in Zahenta Gallery and presentation of her works from the past few years. In her photographs and video works, Joanna Piotrowska is exploring human relationships and their bodily expression. She looks at characters entangled in the context of social institutions, struggling with manifestations of power, emotional dependencies and the violent element of human nature. She's interested in the idea of family, security, home and homelessness, the position of the woman and psychology and politics of the girl rebellion, as well as the human need to control and dominate animals. The personal is political is a very good description of what she explores in her art artistic practice. I would like to briefly point out a series of photographs from 2015 presenting teenage girls or young women in poses taken from self-defense textbooks. The series was created under the influence of texts by the American feminist and developmental psychologist Carol Gilligan, who dealt with the issue of woman's voice and resistance. Issue of woman's voice and resistance bring us to the second reason why we are here today with Rebecca Solnit. Feminist insurrection around democracy, reproductive rights, gender rights, women rights, LGBTQ rights made not only our exhibition more relevant, but also, Rebecca's lecture possible and needed. Agata will elaborate on the social and political context of our meeting after the lecture. And now I will go back to our guest. Rebecca Solnit is a writer, historian, activist, and author of more than 20 books on feminism, Western and urban history, popular power, social change and insurrection, wandering and walking, hope and catastrophe. Her books include Recollections of My Non-Existence, not yet translated into Polish, Hope in the Dark, Men Explain Things to Me, and Paradise, A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary uh, Communities in Arise, uh, That Arise in Disaster. She claims herself a product of California public education system, from the kindergarten to the graduate school. She writes regularly for The Guardian and LitHub and serves on the board of the climate group Oil Change International. Rebecca, thank you once again for accepting my invitation and for making my and few other people's dreams come true. Thank you for being with us today and in this, as I believe, historical moment. Thank you, welcome, and the screen is yours. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Poland. Thank you, fem Feminism. Thank you, all the people who have come to listen to me and us today. It's so such an honor to be talking to a Polish audience in this moment. I've been so moved and so impressed by your feminist insurrections since 2016. I don't know enough about Polish politics and context to speak about it directly. I hope that speaking about my own country and my own observations more broadly about gender, feminism, power, voice, and truth. I'll say something that might be relevant to your country and your situation. 
Of course, the United States has its own troubles with authoritarianism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and the lies and distortions that are part of any authoritarian regime, although it might be more accurate to call the Trump regime a would-be authoritarian regime. We sometimes call it a clown, uh, you know, clown authoritarianism. Because authoritarianism begins and ends with an attempt to overthrow the authority of facts and truth and history and science, which are independent forces, because inequality always includes the question of who, who may speak and who may be heard. My premise is that dictatorships exist at all scales. Authoritarians are in the bedroom and the dining table and the medical clinic, as well as in the parliament or the White House. And in all these places, their agendas and tactics are very much the same. Feminism is likewise a great perspective and set of tools for examining these problems at all scales. And perhaps I should add that I believe feminism is a human rights movement concerned with the rights of women, including the right to be free and equal. I found the tools of feminist analysis useful for understanding the corruptions of government, as well as the corruptions of personal relationships. And of course, the two are not separate. They reinforce and mirror and echo each other. Equality means equality of story, equality of voice, equality of participation. Feminism is as much about narratives and minds as it is about bodies, as much about power as gender. The first inequality that patriarchy our original authoritarianism saddles woman with this inequality of voice and participation, which is what makes all the other inequalities far more possible and powerful. The anti-abortion movement, as it exists in the United States, operates on the principle that women cannot be trusted with decisions about our own bodies, and the state needs to control and contain those bodies, but not the men's bodies, that impregnate women and injure women. And that women and girls do not matter as much as fetuses, which perhaps matter so much more to these politicians because men implant them and because women who control their own bodies are equal to men. There is an extraordinary moment in the hearing about Brett Kavanaugh, the conservative Catholic judge, when he was being challenged to be appointed to the US Supreme Court, where Kamala Harris said, can you think of any laws that govern men's bodies? And he could not, but they were talking about the laws that govern women's bodies, uh, one of the many arenas in which we are still so unequal. In the United States, anti-abortion ideology has always been part of a movement to preserve inequality just like the homophobia, transphobia, and hostility to same-sex marriage that are both about preserving traditional gender roles, which is to say protecting male dominance and female subservience. If a marriage can exist between two men or two women, then marriage is a freely negotiated relationship between equals, not an unchangeable hierarchical relationship of inequality. This is how same-sex marriage is a threat to traditional marriage, so profound a threat that they never say the truth of why it's a threat. It's a threat because what they want to preserve in so-called traditional marriage is traditional inequality. And it's also a demonstration of the way that queer rights and feminist women's rights are inseparable. Both of them are about liberating us from traditional gender roles. All political problems are in part storytelling problems, starting with who tells the story, who is heard, believed, and respected, how the story is told. So much of feminism's work over the past 50 years has been to have a voice, starting with the ninth, and it goes back further, starting with the 19th century struggle for the vote and continuing with the 20th century struggles for bodily self-determination in the form of reproductive rights, freedom from sexual harassment and assault and domestic violence, and equal access to institutions ranging from higher education to political power, and economic justice in the form of wages and access to certain jobs. And of course, 
Reproductive rights are an economic issue too. So the quest has been for a voice to change the story, to tell the stories that were silenced, to dismantle the stories that silenced us or pose a challenge to them. So much of this work has also been about naming things. American feminists coined the term sexual harassment in the 1970s. Before something is named, it is hard to recognize and categorize. So of course it's hard to respond to, even by talking about it, let alone by organizing politically against it or passing laws about it. Feminists coined the powerful phrase, the personal is political, even earlier. Carol Hanisch used it in an essay she wrote in 1969 and published in 1970, half a century ago now, but says she did not invent it. The phrase, the political is personal, excuse me, the personal is political, insists that the so-called private realm is not out of the reach of politics and public accountability. That, that position that private life was private was part of why domestic violence had few legal remedies until feminism arrived. And yet the same societies that said a man beating a woman was not the state's business were eager to say that a woman exercising bodily self-determination through reproductive rights and sexual activity was indeed the state's business. Carol Hanisch wrote about the late 1960s consciousness raising groups where women of that era came together to talk about their lives and found common ground and shared outrage. And she later wrote about how these conversations in this process were trivialized, even by others on the left who sneered at them as personal therapy. Hanisch wrote in 2006, they belittled us no end for bringing out so-called personal problems into the public arena, especially all those body issues like sex, appearance, and abortion. The opposition claimed that if women would just stand up for themselves and take more responsibility for their own lives, they wouldn't need to have an independent movement for women's liberation. In other words, women's problems were personal problems that should be solved through personal individual effort. And the existence of those problems was the fault of the woman and a sign of her weakness. That was what we later termed blame the victim framing from the psychologist William Ryan's 1970 book, Blaming the Victim about racism in the US, which was likewise about how we blame the victims of racism for racism rather than the perpetrators and beneficiaries of racism. One of the things that's been beautiful in the US is to use another wonderful word coming out of feminism and anti-racism, the intersectionality of how racism and feminism form each other. And I've often found black men really good allies who understand sexism in ways white men often don't. So blaming the victim. To be a woman is to be blamed for what men do, to be blamed for not triumphing over what the law does, and what the customs do, and then to be blamed for violating customs and laws and gender norms, if you do triumph over men and laws seeking to subjugate you. To be a woman is to be blamed for pregnancies women uh, do not create alone, to be blamed for sexual assaults that men perpetrate, to be blamed for discrimination that holds you back, to be blamed for, for the forces of patriarchy, and it, which is likewise a narrative that constantly removes the agency that men reserve to themselves and make the things men do, things women made them do ever since Adam made an apple. In the 1970 paper, Carol Hanisch declared, we need to change the objective conditions, not adjust to them. Therapy is adjusting to your bad personal alternative. One of the first things we discover in these groups is that personal problems are political problems. There are no personal solutions at this time. There's only collective action for a collective solution. That's such an important point. That change began with women coming together to listen to each other and like a chorus or a protest, together forge voices loud enough to be heard, even in a society that had been dedicated for centuries 
and even millennia to women's silence. Storytelling was the beginning of that great insurrection. The storytelling that were, was many women's voices finding common experience and common goals, and in so doing, finding power to change things. When I was a young woman facing constant street harassment and threat from men, from strangers who were men, I was constantly told that the solutions were personal, that I should not go to certain places, should not be out at certain times, should not wear certain kinds of clothes, that I should learn martial arts, buy a, buy a gun, never leave the house without a man, never wander alone, buy a car I could not afford, take taxis I could not afford. What I was constantly told in some was that I should accommodate a world in which men wish to harm and humiliate me and accept this malice as natural and inevitable. I was desperate as a young woman for someone, for anyone, to say that I had the right to walk down the street and that this was a human rights and justice issue, not something I should just accommodate by limiting my freedom, by lowering my expectations, by accepting the inevitability of male violence. I wrote in my memoir, Recollections of My Non-Existence, that a lot of men wanted and still want to harm women, especially young women, that a lot of people relish that harm, impacted me in profoundly personal ways, but the cure for it wasn't personal. There was no adjustment I could make in my psyche or my life that would make this problem acceptable or non-existent, and there was nowhere to go to leave it behind. So the only solution was collective, personal, uh, collective political and cultural, because culture is the substructure of politics, Politics arises out of culture, the way that seeds arise from the earth. The personal is political. In the US, marital rape was only criminalized, criminalized in the 1980s and the 1990s, thanks to feminist action. And even the term marital rape is a feminist coinage that comes from transforming marriage itself from the old authoritarian relationship of husband to wife to one of equals. If a husband has absolute right, rights over his wife's body, marital rape is not a concept. The very concept is part of liberating women. And this is part of what I'm emphasizing over and over. Ideas, words, concepts matter so much in this process. It's always a storytelling process. And even those stories are often treated as trivial and lightweight compared to economics, laws, et cetera. It's where, the, where it all begins. The feminist leader, Gloria Steinem, who married for the first time in her 60s, was asked by a reporter from Pakistan why she had changed her mind about marriage by marrying so late. I didn't change, she told him. Marriage changed. We spent 30 years in the United States changing the marriage laws. If I had married when I was supposed to get married, I would have lost my name, my legal residence, my credit rating, many of my civil rights. That's not true anymore. It's now possible to make an equal marriage. The problem for women wasn't personal, it was political. And the state enforced this inequality with laws and the enforcement of laws, reinforcing women's inequality in marriage. Abortion is, from a feminist perspective, the right to privacy and bodily self-determination. Maybe it should be entirely personal, but it is political. It is regulated by the state, and the conservative push to criminalize it is an attempt to deny women equality as citizens and as economic beings, because you cannot be equal in other ways if you do not control your fertility. In Argentina, feminists fighting to win the right to legal abortion there had a great victory yesterday. Gabriela Cabezón Camara, a prominent Argentinian and intellectual guardian, said the approval of the new abortion law, which just passed the lower house yesterday and still has to pass the more conservative upper house. She said it would stop us from being used as birthing machines and allow us to be treated as human beings with the right to decide over our own bodies and destiny. Every problem is a storytelling problem and one of the peculiarities of abortion is that we constantly speak as though women get pregnant on their own 
and are solely responsible for those pregnancies. Sometimes it sounds as though in these versions that women get pregnant because they want to kill babies. And this pretense that women are baby killers is constantly used by women who are in truth women killers. That is by, by people who accept the physical and psychological harm of unwanted or da dangerous or unviable pregnancies, even when that means the mother's life. No woman gets pregnant without sperm from a male source. And no woman gets pregnant unintentionally, except through sex with a man. Many women get pregnant because their lovers and husbands or the laws of their country do not allow them the bodily self-determination that is access to birth control and the agency to use it and otherwise control their own fertility and bodies. Which is to say that many men impregnate women out of a lack of respect for women's rights that is both personal and institutional. So unwanted pregnancy is a cultural and political problem. The personal is political. I think the conversations about abortion and birth control are unfinished until we fully acknowledge both that there is no pregnancy or risk of pregnancy without men. And the problem of pregnancy is not just a problem of women's control of their own bodies, but of their ability to control how men use their bodies. The anti-abortion movement is full of lies and feminism is in some sense a truth-telling mission, a project to tell the truth of women's experience. Another one of the many words used per purely for personal interaction that became useful, hugely useful for public life when Donald Trump was elected president or became president. There's some question if he was truly elected in 2016 and he did not win the popular vote then, as he did not now. But one of the questions, one of the words we began to use to describe public and collective experience when he became president was gaslighting. While most of the words and phrases that have helped feminism describe women's status were created by feminists, gaslighting comes from the 1938 play Gas right, Gaslight by British playwright Patrick Hamilton. In the play, a criminal husband seeks to convince his wife and others that she is delusional and mentally ill by manipulating events and objects around them to both aid and cover up his criminal intentions and criminal past. In other words, he's a liar and a deceiver who seeks to make her appear to be the liar and the person incapable of perceiving truth. Gaslighting works because of the social underpinnings that make it effective. Because we live in a world where men are encouraged to regard their subjective views as objective facts and seem too often to be confident even when they're wrong. Women are encouraged to regard their objective facts as subjective views and to lack confidence even when they're right. So in a sense, patriarchy is gaslighting and gaslighting is a specific attempt to reinforce a broad cultural proposition that women are unreliable witnesses to reality, to our own lives, to what just happened, and therefore are not competent to bear witness, to participate, to tell the story, to have full citizenship and standing, to determine what is real and true. In the terms of George Orwell's Animal Farm, some animals are more equal than others, and this constant insistence of women's untrustworthiness and incompetence is foundational to gaslighting and so many other forms of misogyny, including, I believe, denial of abortion rights and reproductive rights. In the United States, a landmark book for the legal system is John Henry Wigmore's The Rules of Evidence, which describes how the court system, the legal system should work, who we should listen to, who we should believe, who we should trust, how we should decide what is true and who is capable of truth. In his 1934 supplement to this influential book, he warns that judges should be skeptical, skeptical of rape, rape charges because girls and women are manipulative and unreliable witnesses. His, influences, his influence can 
continued at least into the 1980s, arguably into the present, because he reflected broader views about the relative reliability of men and women. Similarly, Sigmund Freud concluded early in his career that many of his female patients who reported being sexually molested as children were not telling the truth about the fathers and other powerful men in their life, that these powerful men were not criminals, these girls and women were delusional, and wish that these things had happened, thus helping silence victims of such sexual abuse for almost a century longer. Last year in the US, Tara Westover's book, Educated, became a huge bestseller. It's a story, a memoir, a true story, about a young woman who grows up in a far right wing, white supremacist family of fundamentalist Christians, dominated by a patriarch, caught up in paranoia and conspiracy theories. When she's a teenager, one of her brothers begins to torture her physically and psychologically. The parents ignore this. Years later, when first her sister and then she speak up, her mother acknowledges their reality, then joins their father in denying it. Then comes a crisis where she's told that the price of admission to the family is a, is a denial of this reality of her brother's abuse. The price of admission to the family is protection of the brother, continued abuse of the sisters, because boys are more important than girls, because boys are vessels that can contain the truth and girls are not, because boys matter more. The father demands proof of Tara Westover because the testimony of his daughter is not enough, but his son is, because the question of who will be believed has been decided before the stories began to be told. Westover writes grippingly about the period in which she tried to accept the rules of the game and lost confidence in her own ability to perceive and remember what happened. She writes, I began to defer always to the judgment of others. She has learned to gaslight herself. When I read Westover's book, I was shocked at first because this was such a clear cut and extreme example of someone being told not to believe herself not to trust herself, to see herself as an unreliable witness, as well as to accept that others regarded her as such. And then after a month of trying that, she went back to trusting her own version and finding others who confirmed it. But what was shocking for me is I realized that what she described was not unusual. It was ordinary and common. And I had my own version of it over and over in my family. And then from so many men and boys who told me what had just happened had not really happened, that I was not an objective witness or not a competent witness to my own life, to what just happened, to the record, to the words I heard. And really it took me until about 2000, until I was almost 40, to trust myself more than them, to not accept this gaslighting. It came to me personally, as I wrote in my essay, Men Explain Things to Me, in part because I was the author of, his, of books of history, because I was a professional at describing the past, at gathering information, at sifting for evidence, at looking for, for and verifying facts. And it's shocking to me now that it took me so long that I had been so easy to push around, to push out of my own version, to shout over. And this is often seen as not significant, but it's so significant to for example, there would be no sexual abuse if women and children had equal voices to men in systems where these things are crimes. It's only because we are not believed that these crimes have been perpetrated. I realized when Harvey Weinstein, the powerful movie producer, was finally sentenced and went to jail, that if we had been in a world where women had equal credibility, audibility, and equal consequence when we spoke up, there would have been either one incidence of sexual abuse by Harvey Weinstein and his voice, his victim, 
would have had the capacity to speak up, to testify, and society would have granted her the credibility to listen to her, or there would have been none because he did it because he knew these women had no voice, no credibility, would not be believed. The more than 90 women he assaulted were assaulted because we live in a world of unequal voice, unequal credibility, unequal consequence for our voices, because patriarchy is gaslighting. Here's what is significant about gaslighting. It's about who gets to determine the truth. It's about the replacement of truth by any objective standard by power. And when power becomes corrupt, it replaces independent truth and systems of verifying truth with what the powerful person or party or ideology deems convenient. Most of the examples of gaslighting are of men who use their power to enforce falsehoods, pressuring women and children to agree that something happened that did not in reality happen, or to deny something that did happen in reality, to shift blame, to control, indivi vi to control individuals by controlling their, re their reality. But a whole nation or society or culture can be gaslit by having foundational stories, underlying stories that are lies and distortions that paint some of us as subhuman or criminal or incompetent. And these are racial stories as well as gender stories. In the last four years, gaslighting has been used constantly to describe our political situation. For example, here in the US, we are now a country where Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have very clearly won the presidential election by more than 7 million votes. But Donald Trump has convinced tens of millions of people that something completely different happened, convinced them not to trust evidence, not to, con not to trust the mainstream news media, not to trust the election officials, in conservative as well as progressive states, not to trust anything except his story, that of course is an absolute lie of convenience and arrogance and ego. Out of fear and self-interest and malice and cowardice, many of the most prominent Republican politicians in this country are going along with this lie. It is only the latest example of gaslighting and here I might note, there are two kinds of victims of gaslighting, those who truly believe the liar and those who don't, but have little choice but to live with the consequences. Because gaslighting is part of a larger system of, of authoritarianism in which the authority assumes power, not only, other, not only over other humans, but over truth and fact. Or perhaps we could say, refuses to accept the inherent authority of truth and fact and, re and respect for that authority that is central to democracy and the rule of law. That is in a democracy in a system of truthfulness, the truthfulness of history and science and reason. The authority lies in the facts themselves and we grant that authority to people who align themselves with those truths. Under authoritarianism, there is no truth, no fact, no history, no science only whatever stories the authorities want. Of course, authoritarian regimes have a long history of gaslighting. Nazi anti-Semitism was a sort of gaslighting, as is all anti-Semitism, in which a fictitious history of Jewish acts, identity, and motives is mustered to gen justify a genocide that too many denied was happening at the time and after. The term could have been used all along to describe political realities. The lies about slavery, the genocide against Native Americans here in the US, the lies by and about Stalinism and the totalitarianism of the East Bloc there, about any more powerful group or governing body that misuses its power to erase and invent history, fact, truth, to deny science as the US government and the oil powers deny the reality of climate change and the crisis of climate chaos now engulfing us. I wrote in the spring of 2018, in the wake of the revelations about sexual abuse, we call Me Too. We do things with words when they have power, 
Set boundaries, swear oaths, bear witness. But if your words have no power, it is almost worse to speak them than not, to see them fail than not. Facts circulate freely in a democracy of information that results from a democracy of voices. We have something else instead, from personal life to national politics, a hierarchy of audibility and credibility, a brutal hierarchy in which people with facts often cannot prevail because those who have more power push those facts out of the room and into silence or make the cost of stating those facts dangerously high. That's how the oil industry turned the fact and facts and science of climate change into a fake debate full of fake uncertainties about reality. It's how the impeachment trial of Donald Trump turned into a showcase for how to override facts and laws. And it's how the movie producer Harvey Weinstein raised an army to protect his power to grab and grope and rape with impunity until now. Sexual assault is perhaps the cl clearest and grimmest example of how unequal power generates crimes and then protects those who create them, but it's not the only one. And that's been so much what's happening in my own understanding in the last four years as feminism became a tool for understanding both the personal violence directed or the individual violence directed against women and the violence of authoritarianism against the environment, the climate, the rule of law, the collective, and as well as against history and science and individuals. Elsewhere in 2018, as the corruptions of Donald Trump became worse, but simultaneously the, re the revelations about male sexual abuse were heard and discussed and had consequences never before, I wrote. Cousin to the noun dictate is the verb, cousin to the noun dictator is the verb dictate. There are among us people who assume their authority is so great they can dictate what happened that their assertions will override witnesses, videotapes, evidence, a historical record, that theirs is the only voice that matters, and it matters so much it can stand tall atop the conquered facts. Lies are aggressions. They are attempts to dictate, to trample down the facts and those who hold them, and they lay the groundwork for the dictatorships, the little ones in families, the big ones in nations. Black Lives Matter has shown us policemen who continue to insist on their version of events even when there is videotaped evidence to the contrary, or when physical evidence and eyewitnesses contradict their accounts of events. For example, they constantly claim they were being attacked by men they shot in the backs. You realize that they had assumed they could dictate reality because for decades they actually had and they're having a hard time adjusting to reality dictating back. As one of the Marx Brothers comedians quipped long ago, who are you going to believe? Me or your lying God? Me or your own eyes? The police assumed it was neither our eyes nor the evidence that they had more authority than either. That victims will remain voiceless was the presumption behind much of the sexual abuse that's been uncovered in the Me Too era. Getting away with it is the same thing as assuming that no one will know because your victim will be intimidated or shamed into silence or that if he or she speaks up, they can be discredited or bullied back into silence or that even if they don't shut up, no one will believe them because your credibility crushes theirs. That yours is the only version that counts even if you have to use savage means to make it so. And of course, sometimes this extends into the actual violence. Victims, particularly of sexual abuse, have been killed over and over and over again to prevent them from testifying. And of course, this happens in many arenas. In Mexico, a journalist was just, a photojournalist was just murdered because he documented murders by the government or by gangs. In a headline I glimpsed this morning, it keeps happening. People keep trying to silence the truth and too often they succeed. And this is the foundational act of all authoritarianism. 
Most of us think of truth as something that arises from facts that exist independently of our wills and whims. We have no choice in the matter, but we also believe in some sort of objective reality, either a thing or did, did either a thing did or did not happen. A sentence was or was not said. A substance is or is not poison. What's clear now is that a minority of us think that they can enforce a version that is divorced from factuality, and they always have. It corrupts everything around them, and the corruption begins within them. Somewhere inside them, they know that they are liars and that they're imposing compliance to lies. I wrote that in 2018. I'm not sure they do. I'm not sure they exist in what we consider objective reality, that they exist in a kind of delusion while they insist that they're their only people competent to be arbiters of truth and fact. So gaslighting is a collective cultural phenomenon and it makes cultures feel crazy the way it does individual victims. That we are supposed to pretend that mass shootings and the epidemic gun death rate in the United States have nothing to do with the availability of guns is insane that there is nothing to the Trump team's dozens of covert contacts with the Putin regime's figures during the campaign and the investigation is another lie we were supposed to believe as we are told that the investigation was a baseless witch hunt, witch hunt being an anti-feminist term suggesting that unpopular pursuits of truth, oh, it's complicated because it's essentially the powerful who hate women identifying with the witches who are persecuted women, a kind of reversal that I'll talk about in a minute. One striking thing about all this, we've been told forever that men are honest, objective, reliable, and rational, and women are dishonest, subjective, unreliable, and irrational. But gaslighting is a framework in which mostly men, whether the tyrant of the family or the nation, has assumed the right to dominate and abuse history, science, fact, and truth. That reality is whatever they want it to be. Historian Heather Cox Richardson wrote of Trump's impeachment trial, but for Trump and his enablers, this trial is not about the truth. It never has been. It is about dominance and power. Forcing someone to accept what they know to be untrue reinforces the dominance of the person telling the lies. And here I should say maybe gaslighting is specific to making people not trust themselves, but there's another kind of lying that forces people to live with things they know are lies, whether it's about abortion or history, about the Holocaust, about climate change, about police violence, about racism, about homophobia, about marriage equality, about so many things. I want to talk about one more idea that comes out of feminism, another idea generated to understand and change the personal, but that applies all too well to the political. It's the acronym DARVO, D-A-R-V-O, coined by psychologist Jennifer J. Freed in 1997, she wrote back then. I've recently begun to think about a way to conceptualize the events that occur when a victim or a concerned observer openly confronts an abuser about his or her behavior after a long period of silence in which the abuser could abuse without facing consequence. My proposal is that the frequent response of an abuser to being held, to count, to being held accountable is the DARVO response. DARVO stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. What's notable here is that it is not only an attempt to shout down the truth, but to shout it down with a sort of mirror image fiction that attempts to smear the accuser, we could say the truth teller, and to confuse any bystanders. For example, if a woman reports that her husband is violent, people might listen, but if her husband shouts that she's the violent one, it becomes confusing and chaotic, and listeners, including police or courts, may give up seeking the truth. To dominate the truth and bury the facts, the Trump administration has been an extraordinary example of DARVO. Nearly everything Trump is guilty of, nepotism, theft, corruption, exploiting his office for profit, 
illicit foreign alliances, he has falsely accused his opponents of. In a way, we could consider the anti-abortion movement also DARVA. It is a movement that is murderously hostile to women's rights and lives, that pretends and demands that we all agree it is a movement in defense of fetuses' rights and lives. In the USA, it proceeds with specific lies. Anti-abortion laws are built on anti-abortion lies. Lies about things like who has abortions and why. In this country, most women who have abortions want to be mothers, are mothers, but want to limit family size. They are not irresponsible. They do not hate babies. They are not against motherhood or enemies of motherhood. But they are con women who have abortions are constantly portrayed as such. There are other lies about how women's bodies work and how fetuses develop. The lies pave the way for the laws. For example, fetal heartbeat bills that have been passed in some conservative states are lies because they define an embryo as a fetus when those are two different stages of development. And the fluttering of what is not yet a fully formed heart as a heartbeat, thereby denying access to early abortion of an embryo. And also trying to convince people to imagine a tiny embryo as a fully formed baby with a heart. Similarly, a right-wing man sought to pass a bill in one of our states to save the embryos in ectopic pregnancies, pregnancies in the fallopian tubes, even though those embryos cannot be saved and the pregnant woman can die of this pregnancy outside the uterus. It was a profoundly anti-scientific attempt to force women to die rather than to have a procedure to save their lives that would only remove a fetus or an embryo that could not possibly become a baby. Given how rarely men are convicted of rape, oh, and then, sorry, I jumped ahead. I wrote at the time that, or, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit, the great, American writer Michelle Alexander, best known for her work on the racism involved in who goes to prison in this country, another kind of gaslighting about who's a criminal, made a really important point in an article in the New York Times, which is that when we say we should have an exception for women who have been raped and children who have been molested, what we do is we put them on trial to prove that that happened. And that's an incredibly difficult and often very dangerous thing to do. Given how rarely men are convicted of rape and how slow and intrusive and hostile to victims the legal process is, one can imagine the fetus reaching preschool age or maybe kindergarten or possibly law school before the court case is concluded, i.e. the process to prove that one has been a victim may be dangerous to the victim, it, did not, it denies her ability to, it forces her to prove what she knows and treats her as an unreliable witness. And it may actually be dangerous because speaking up about being abused is often a very dangerous thing. So it puts, puts the pregnant person in tremendous danger and also often locks her into a process that may move too slowly for the medical reality of how pregnancies develop. This is hate wrapped up in gaslighting that takes the form of DARVO. It makes the woman the guilty party who has to prove her innocence in order to have access to an abortion. I could go on, but I should wrap up. So I want to say in conclusion, feminism is a project in pursuit of human rights and equality. Equality means we are all equal before the facts and the truth. And history and science are not just whatever the powerful want them to be. Equality means that everyone has an equal right to be heard, that no one will be bullied out of their capacity to witness and testify, that facts, truth, evidence, history, science have their own authority, which no one has the authority to corrupt, distort, override, or erase. Feminism has always been a democracy project, and there is no democracy without feminism. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Are we... Uh, everybody are? Magda, do you have uh, your voice back? Yes, I do. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thank you very much for your uh, very thought-provoking talk. And uh, as you know, amid a COVID crisis, we are in the middle of feminist revolution in Poland, uh, who, whose outcome is still unknown. So we are extremely happy to have you here as an expert in nurturing hope and reclaiming uh, women's voices. And uh, as you probably know, and uh, I thought that I, f I hope that some of our audiences know it as well, that the current protests were triggered by a verdict of the Constitutional Court that means a virtually total ban on abortion. So, um, nevertheless, what is really at stake here is not only women's access to the medical procedure, but also access to the public sphere. sphere. So, of of course, it would be a story as well of gaslighting understood, as you have just said, as collective cultural phenomenon. And uh, so uh, let me explain briefly, um, you know, the, describe the context. So uh, when Poland was the part of the communist bloc, uh, termination of pregnancy was legal in the case of difficult uh, life circumstances. Uh, so it means that it was really easily accessible. But ironically, not long after Poles regained freedom and democracy in 1989, Polish women lost their freedom of choice, of course. In 1983, a law forbidding abortion was passed uh, with only three exceptions. And these exceptions are when the pregnancy is the result of a crime, so rape or incest, uh, when the mother's life and health are in danger, and when the fetus is developing abnormally. So, in doing so, passing this law, male post-solidarity politicians may uh, deal with the Catholic Church, ignoring women activists, public opinion and the petition for a referendum on the issue, signed by over one million citizens. <laughs> what is, what's more, they not only did that, but only called that deal a compromise. So, uh, Polish feminist Agnieszka Graf uh, underlines that this compromise did not only concern the abortion law itself. It, she defines it as a set of unwritten rules which have regulated public discourse, uh, the air we used to breathe, the limits of reality we lived in, as she put it. So, accordingly to, according to these rules, the Catholic Church gained a monopoly on moral values, particularly this referring to sexuality. As a result, women's and LGBT rights were uh, bargained away in exchange for support for the economic transformation and joining the EU. The result, the result was that these rights were depicted as, and this is uh, you know, translation of the true term, ersatz concerns. So dealing with them was constantly uh, being postponed to a better moment and of course it was mocked as something and nobody is interested in abortion. This is a kind of a fake problem. Uh, so the whole public sphere was founded on structural hypocrisy and abortion is a very good example of it. So in reality, access to the procedure is stressful, humiliating, but relatively easy for women with sufficient funds. As we are in the European Union, borders are open, so you can order pills from abroad or travel to Slovakia, Germany or UK. In Slovakia, you have even special clinics for Polish women with Polish translation of everything. So, uh, in fact, the access uh, and the women, women are not punished for that. So, this is a kind of, uh, you know, totally fake reality. And um, the main result of this, the law is not limiting the number of terminations, of course, but censoring women's experience and voices. And for example, an activist helping women to get a safe abortion, Natalia Broniarczyk from the wonderful um, the, the organization called uh, Abortion Dream Team, and she wrote in her coming out story that uh, when she needed the procedure a few years ago, the stigma was so strong that she had been afraid to ask her feminist friends. And then afterwards, uh, she was afraid to admit, even in private, that she didn't feel sorry for it. So this show uh, how, how, how 
what kind of power this compromise held on us and it was a real gaslighting tool which the whole generation was brought, brought up with and uh, uh, I and Magda here and uh, Bronyarczyk herself and uh, Joanna Petrovska the artist uh, uh, who made the photos we are you know uh, the, the, all, all the exhibition we all belong to this generation so the another paradox is that the compromise was undermined not by left by by the right since law and justice came to power in 2015 several attempts to tighten the abortion law were made so and it was so outrageous that you know even with this free exemption they would like uh, would like to rule out the exemption when uh, fetus are uh, developed uh, un um, abnormally so it sparked a really uh, fury and uh, real rage so in reaction to, to to this attempt uh in autumn 2016 uh, thousands of women uh, went out onto the streets uh, and the organization All Women and Women's Strike was established. And to be honest, it was a kind of surprise for everybody, even for organizers, because uh, in Poland till that time, everybody really were gaslighted a little bit that, OK, nobody, there wouldn't be much uh, mass protest about abortion. And uh, one day uh, it has happened. And uh, this autumn, uh, the protests are even bigger and much more radical as women in their 20s and teenagers broke these unwritten rules of the compromise. So the new generation came and the whole situation has changed. And uh, now uh, protesters uh, attack not only the Catholic Church and the ruling party, but also all men from all political options who want to explain things to them. And I think that uh, this is an essence of mocking Polish neologism jaders, because we have a kind of a Polish word for all the men who try to, you know, impose his uh, worldview on you. And uh, this, this uh, word became very popular uh, now. And the main slogan is very, very vulgar as well. It's fuck off. So uh, the kind of decorum, the kind of, you know, this, uh, uh, this belief that we should be, you know, we should be polite, that we should explain, that we should wait, uh, has vanished. Uh, so I summarize this uh, local context because I, um, I see a lot of universal mechanism. And of course, when I read your books, I can, uh, you know, find a lot of things. This, you know, this unborn baby, like embryos and unborn baby, or, you know, trying to depict abortion as a problem of, uh, of uh, women who hate babies and don't have babies, while in fact, abortion is a problem of pregnant women for the first, for, for first and most important thing. Uh, but I believe that it's very important to understand the local dynamics as well. That uh, uh, and this is um, so. I would like to ask you: um, How can you imagine kind of feminist collaboration on this global and local level? So, should we think about feminism as one global movement, a network of grassroots organization, or maybe a platform to share tools to be used locally? And uh, how do you assess the last few years in this more global context? And um, how do you see the future if you <laughs> can, you know, have, a, have any, if, if you dare to say anything about the future at this point? Oh, thank you for that small, easy question. That's really at least three questions. <laughs> but it's actually great. At, um, you know, I think that local differences to live in Saudi Arabia is very different than to live in Argentina, to live in, you know, at um, China is very different than to live in New Zealand. So I, th I think there's a, there's a maybe, maybe the, maybe it's about having models that there is there are things that are global about feminism and there are things that have to be local and specific to the culture, the history, the politics, the laws. And so, you know, the model of a conversation means that we can help each other by helping to evolve ideas and uh, concepts and supporting each other in that way while respecting that there's no one size fits all feminism. You know, if we don't have the same problems 
exactly. We don't have the same solutions exactly. And, uh, you know, or another model could be a kind of ecological model in that there are certain, certain universal rules about biological life, but they're very different in, say, the Arctic than the tropics and uh, different species prevail. So um, as for the state of feminism, I feel like what's been happening for the last eight years was something I was waiting all my life for. The book I published recently, Recollections of My Non-Existence, is, was about trying to become a writer, which is a person who has a voice that is heard, you know, that is published, that has some power in the world, while also being a young woman who is constantly silenced, ignored, harassed, threatened, told that I was incompetent to bear witness even to what just happened in the conversation, let alone to the kind of history I aspired to write about it as a nonfiction writer and a journalist. And, uh, you know, and I've mentioned, I read that little passage about street harassment. When I was a young woman, street harassment was just treated as something you needed to learn to deal with better by most people. And all the rest of violence against women was ignored, trivialized, and also blamed on the victim. If a woman got raped, it was, what was she wearing? Why did she go to the party? She shouldn't have had that drink. If she was sexually active, clearly she was a whore because a woman who agreed to have sex with anyone was, with one person was a person who had agreed to have sex with any person, etc. And so I felt like I was waiting for a conversation that didn't exist yet. It existed in some ways in you know, the feminism, even when I was a young woman and before. But as a, as a public conversation, as a conversation that had real impact on policy, on the legal system, on how court, how cases would be written about and discussed and treated in courts of law, um, that, you know, was still pure patriarchy. And so really in about 19, in about 2012, thanks to the rape, torture, murder of Jyoti Singh in India, the Steubenville rape case in the central United States of an unconscious teenager raped by her older fellow students, and, uh, you know, and the campus gender violence movement, we finally began to have that conversation at the level it needed to be, where it engaged the public, it engaged the people who decide what should happen. It changed a lot of the stories. For example, one of the beautiful slogans that came out of it was rapist cause rape. I mean, yeah. It's not caused by your dress, your drink, the fact that you were walking down the street, the fact that you weren't a nun locked in a bank vault. And um, so we, and we began, you know, and so an extraordinary conversation began to happen that I think is ongoing. And of course it's incremental, uh, you know, it builds on the feminism of the last 50 years, which builds on the feminism of the last 200 and maybe going back to Mary Wollstonecraft, 250 years, almost 230 years. So, and where do we go from here? And uh, I don't know. I am a hopeful person. And I do believe that ideas are like the genie and the Arabian Nights. Once it's out of the bottle, it's very hard to get an idea back into the bottle. Once women understand all the ways they were unequal, it's hard to make us not under not understand those things. And part of why women accepted that inequality is the framework of equality hadn't really been applied in the ways that it would be by feminism from the 1960s onward. So I think ideas are ideas about marriage equality, ideas about reproductive rights, ideas, the idea that to be uh, homosexual is neither a crime nor a mental illness is an idea that will not be erased. I think that idea that ideas are very powerful. It's part of why it's so exciting being a storyteller. And I think those ideas will continue to be powerful in the world. I also think that people will fight them. 
And something I think is really important about abortion specifically is they can make abortion illegal, but they can't make women believe that they don't have their right to abortion as easily. And so I think, it, I don't know about your country, but I know in my country, they can take the right away. And there are certainly women as well as men in the anti-abortion side of American politics, but they can't convince the great majority of women that they shouldn't have that right. Uh, just like they can't convince the majority of queer people that they shouldn't be equal in marriage and other things and et cetera. So I feel like the power of ideas cannot be underrated and that these ideas are out in the world doing their work. And so far we've mostly seen, we've seen pushback against them, but I don't think they can be erased or disappeared so that even if there are legal measures against them, the ultimate power lies with the idea, not the law. And as long as the idea is there, there's the possibility of changing the law uh, exists. And uh, I don't know if that sort of answers your questions. Uh, Magda, good, I think. Uh, before I will ask my few questions, one, uh, I will um, I will encourage our public to to ask questions through chat, uh, through Facebook and through um, our YouTube channel. Uh, so I would like to uh, come up with the sign you, we already know and have seen. I can't believe we still have to protest this shit. We've seen this signs in, uh, in Washington in 2017, in London. We have seen it in Warsaw in 2016 and 2020. So uh, the question is, why do we need to still protest the same things? Why do we need to repeat the same postulates, the same thesis um, on the streets, in our exhibitions, in our books, in our essays? Um, or maybe I can even ask the same question um, Carol Gilligan was asking in 2011. Why do we still need to study gender? And, um, and maybe more impo importantly, how can we deal with the frustration of, uh, of this repetition? Uh, uh, and how can we deal with the frustration this repetition causes? I I think a useful way to talk about it would be not to, to answer your question a little bit indirectly. Patriarchy is thousands of years old and it feels very Western sometimes, by which I mean the whole Western world, this idea that we should have fixed it in a generation. And, uh, you know, and often what makes me hopeful is taking the long view. I was born in 1961. I like to joke that I'm the same age as the Berlin Wall, but doing much better. The Berlin Wall does not moisturize. And, uh, but, um, you know, the world I was born into was one in which my mother in her marriage was absolutely unequal. Um, a woman did not have right to financial independence. She did not have the right to access birth control and other medical procedures without her husband's permission. Marriage essentially defined women as their husband's possessions. Uh, marital rape was not a concept. Domestic violence was something that officially was illegal, but was widely regarded as something not only that husbands had the right, right to do, but that was wives' fault, that kind of Darvo, uh, you know, reverse victim and accuser. She made him do it. The inequality of women was profound. There were uh, the Ivy League universities, which you know, propel people into power in this country, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, mostly did not admit women. And, and there had been no women on the Supreme Court, almost no women senators. And the very idea that women should be equal in these positions of power, should have equal access to various roles uh, in various professions, uh, should be paid equally. Those ideas did not yet exist at, in that nobody was really arguing them. And uh, it was also a country that was very unequal racially and in which to be 
gay, lesbian, trans, queer was to be defined as aberrant, criminal, mentally ill, and punished as such. And uh, many forms of discrimination were legal that are now illegal around gender, race, and sexual orientation, etc. And so when I look at how profoundly we've changed things in the last, it's going to be 60 years since I was born next year, I see something remarkable because there is no authoritarianism. I mean, racism is not as old as patriarchy. Christianity is not as old as patriarchy. Monotheism is arguably maybe as old as patriarchy, but very few other institutions are. And so the fact that we've actually changed it so profoundly in a little over 50 years, it makes me actually feel tremendously successful and hopeful. And it is frustrating. And, you know, in many arenas that we don't win definitive victories. But I also wonder if that's partly our Western thinking and that we think, you know, Christianity teaches us that, you know, there is an immortal afterlife and there is salvation, which means that a situation is resolved permanently. In other words, I think we could think about maybe a Buddhist model of reincarnation. Let me tip up. There's a there's a Buddha up up, up there watching over us, as well as an Andean piece of ceramics, to say that maybe there's a reincarnational model where you have to keep trying over and over, and you might advance with each reincarnation. So you know, I think. And also if you neglect something, it gets worse again. I'm one thing that American activists would say, like I grew up with people saying, save the whales. And there's two ways that save gets used mostly in English. Jesus saves, which is your eternal salvation or saving, like putting money in the bank. And whales are neither money we can put in the bank nor something Jesus can, you know, or anything else can permanently protect. So what we actually have to do is keep protecting the whales. And if we stop doing that, then the whales are no longer protected. We have to keep protecting those rights. And in some ways I find the backlash not encouraging, but the backlash of the last 10 years has been because women, because queer people, because environmentalists have actually won a lot. They're pushing back harder than they were before and they're frightened. The fact that they're frightened of us is very encouraging. Something I do all the time is look at what our enemies think of us. And often people on the left, progressive movements feel very powerless. But when you see that others are frightened of us, sometimes that's a very true assessment that we're very powerful. So I totally agree that it's frustrating. I totally agree there should be a universal human right. Uh, to reproduct that's reproductive rights and we should never have to fight for them again and uh, you know I totally agree with I can't believe we're still doing this shit at the same time we're not doing some of the shit we were doing we have established a lot of rights by that radically redefine gender and sexuality and race and that radically delegitimize authoritarianism in the family, the school, the workplace, and to some extent the nation in ways that are remarkable. And so one thing I always do, I call myself the hope lady because I started writing about hope 17 years ago, is I encourage us to remember our victories and remembering our victories is often being historically minded, looking at the past, looking at the long arc of change, Martin Luther King famously said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. I'm not sure it's true, but it's the long arcs that make me hopeful. It's the long arcs where I see that actually feminism has been extraordinarily successful overall, uh, particularly considering that it's an old institution. There's a wonderful uh, artist, Mary Beth Edelson, who in the 1970s made an artwork I love so much for its title. It was when radicals were always saying to dictators, your, fi your 50 years are up, your 20 years are up, your 17 years are up. So she made a piece about patriarchy called your 5,000 years are up. That's the long arc of history. And they're not, it's not up, but we've made a lot of inroads and we have so much more to do. So uh, your, uh, your book, Hope in the Dark, was uh, translated into Polish, I think, 
last year or two years ago and it have you know it was very inspiring a lot of people read it and uh, it it was very discussable and i like it very much and some people sometimes say oh it's a little bit optimistic it's like it's too optimistic uh, but the mo the thing i like uh, like the most is this different uh, way of thinking about temporality and about christianity this longing for kind of redemption or utopia and even when preparing to this talk at what you have just said about uh, your mother's marriage it's like uh, um, somebody commented that there is a, a child crying in the in the background and now I'm feeding, breastfeeding the child. So can you imagine uh, even a few years ago having a public conversation uh, during which, uh, you know, uh, a woman pre presenter can, you know, breastfeed? It's, uh, this is the change. We, we have to, you know, really think about <laughs> what we uh, what we achieved. And, um, um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Hope in the Dark and uh, the Hope in the Dark and I think that a lot of your writings are onto different kind of on, of storytelling, the power of storytelling, how to change our storytelling and what we can do about it. And one of the most inspiring piece of you for me uh, on this topic was this article uh, published on the Lead Hub uh, when, when the hero is a problem. Uh, in which you say that uh, the problem is that social action is always boring, uh, not spectacular, very difficult to tell uh, to tell a really emotionally engaged, uh, engaging story on that. And uh, so I have two questions about that. Uh, one, how can you imagine this different kind of storytelling? And maybe you have some uh some examples of it because uh when i started to think about it i i thought maybe uh the new me medium of series the when you have a tv series in which you can depict a lot of different uh characters and their relation between of them give some more useful tool for it i i think about orange is the new black as a kind of series which my be considered in this way and about movie about spotlight so but for example spotlight the person i uh, was watching it with uh, said that it's extremely boring and uh, she doesn't know what it's about so uh, <laughs> so this is the risk behind that and uh, maybe some people can say that uh, uh, that this hero story is a basic uh, kind of uh, mythology story and that uh, this is a kind of cognitive capacities that make us you know telling such kind of story so maybe you have some thoughts of it this is a kind of a uh, this is a problem which haunts me uh, especially in the context of uh, uh, climate crisis because this is the the problem we have to solve with absolutely different way of telling story with uh, with uh, taking real responsibility in our personal lives but at the same time treat it really politically and there is no uh, you know there is no use of uh, you know hero idea here as you as you wrote to yourself uh, referring to to Greta Thunberg that this is that she was possible because so many people area had done a lot of very not spectacular work. I think that masculinity and individualism as in the person who is separate from everybody else and owes, you know, acts independently, that, you know, a real kind of isolation is typical of masculinity. And we create heroes so often in this culture, particularly in movies, who are isolated individuals, and we then we, we over and over we show problem solving as masculine violence enacted by exceptional individuals, and it's supposed to be feminist that we now have you know female bodies doing this very alienated, violent, masculine stuff. We watched a movie a week or two ago called The Old Regime about immortals who are people who have magically become immortal and they've continued to essentially be violent soldiers for, in one case, you know, 2000 years. And I'm like, oh my God, after, you know, being killed in battle the first 300 times, maybe you would find some other way to exercise power, but it's, it's basically an elite commando squad. And so I think that, you know, 
in a way, feminism has to shy away from violence because violence is something men are better at. And if violence is always authoritarianism, the attempt to dominate somebody else through, you know, through physical means, including the taking of life. But also, you know, even leaving feminism aside, the way we actually change things is together. And I've been part of mass movements. I've been in crowds of thousands of people knowing that I'm in a group of 10,000 people and that other people all around the world are standing up together, whether it's against corporate globalization in Seattle and also around the world in 1999, against the war in Iraq in February of 2003, and um, you know, moments where the climate movement is global action, et cetera. And there's actually something mystical and moving and profound about the collective. And I think it's present in some of our art in the power of a chorus and I have seen movies, I'm kind of remembering maybe V for Vendetta, where individual action becomes collective action, but I haven't seen it in a long time. There's a movie about Martin Luther King by Ava, oh, I'm forgetting her last name, the black uh, woman director, about Martin Luther King and the March, the Selma, uh, Birmingham to Selma March, that was a decisive event in the civil rights movement. And so we do have some things. I think we don't recognize the beauty that's really deeply emotional and personal about collectives and, you know, which sounds like it could be a bad word in, you know, collectivized Eastern Europe, but I mean by mass movements, by groups, by people coming together. And, uh, you know, and that there's room for filmmakers to make things where you can photograph on an individual, but as somebody who's part of a collective. And there was a movie about Brit the British suffrage movement a few years ago that kind of showed it, but it was a pretty dismal, defeatist movie. But I think this leaves room for a lot of great filmmakers to make uh, you know, make movies that do this and for us to leave behind the horrible violence of Hollywood movies, which for some reason I've been talking a lot about this week, which is usually misogynist violence. Cause, and, uh, you know, and tell this other story about the power that we have. And of course that essay, which I'm so glad you like, because it's one of my favorite things I've written recently. And it was so satisfying to write is about an Icelandic movie where a woman is literally a choir director. And what do, what does a choir director do? She gets, a group of people to sing in unison, which is exactly what activism is. You get people to do something together, like your beautiful marches on the streets of, uh, you know, in Warsaw and elsewhere in Poland. But the movie makes her an environmental activist who is secretive and solo in her activism and blows things up. And that actually is not, and it's not actually effective. And it's also a misogynist movie because it turns out she doesn't really care that much about the climate crisis. What she really needs is a baby. And, you know, so the whole thing is a fucked up piece of shit from hell to describe it in accurate terms. So, you know, but I, I remember when I wrote about it at the time, people posted a lot of responses. Maybe I'll look them up and try and share some of the good stories. But a lot of my own work has been writing about these collectives, writing about the extraordinary movements of civil society in response to disasters and the deep emotion people feel when they become part of this kind of movement together, which I remember in the Eastern European uprisings in 1989 and the response to disasters as well as to political movements, which often feel like the same thing because a political movement is, a, is also a response to a kind of political disaster. Thank you. We we are running out of time. Um, there are not so many questions, more declarations of love to you on our Facebook chat. Uh, but I pick up one. Can we ask, answer just w one last question? I will combine it with mine because I'm also interested. It's a question about language. And I'm, I was also interested in, um, in asking you about language. Uh, Marta is asking on our Facebook chat, she's asking about 
what language do you find most useful, powerful, or effective? She's a writer, so she's asking uh, from this perspective. But I, what I wanted to add, um, what, interested, what is interesting also uh, for me, that the feminist revolution in Poland also take place on the field of language. Um, in the in inflected languages like Polish, French, German, Spanish, the concept of masculinity and femininity is um, is inscribed in the language itself. Um, and analysis conducted uh, by the World Economic Forum in 2012 uh, showed that in countries with inflected languages, uh, there are mm, with, where in every every statement shows uh, the cl uh, clear division between male and female forms. Um, this, uh, languages have the biggest gender inequalities. And these are countries with, uh, with those inflected languages have the uh, biggest gender inequalities. inequalities. Equality leaders turn out to be countries with gender neutral languages like uh, English, for example. But when we are talking uh, about language, what is uh, in the context of protest, uh, what is most interesting for me now is the um, discussion on vulgarity and uh, about vulgarity and politeness maybe we, we can we can um, also say that feminism was already in the past very often criticized for inappropriate uh, in, inappropriateness and the rad radicalism uh, and it it was and it still is a common opinion that uh, feminists are not successful because of their um, aggressive uh, aggression and inappropriate language. So um, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think about language as a tool of taboo breaking and, um, and is vulgarity a way to undo systems? And maybe also somehow we can add Marta's question about uh, what kind of language you find more useful, powerful, effective? Vulgar is such an interesting word. I think it comes from the Latin and it means the common people. And so it sounds like there's uh, gaslighting insisting that women must be ladylike at all times and not speak, you know, the, the language of common people. And I, want, I think in a way that there's a term in activism, diversity of tactics. I think some of us need to be legal scholars. Some of us need to be academic researchers and historians. Some of us need to speak in ways that people do very professionally. Some of us need to be doctors who testify about the medical realities of the, you know, pregnancy, abortion, et cetera. And some of us need to say that shit is fucked up and needs to, needs to go to hell. My friend, uh, Mona El Tahawi is, you might know as an Egyptian, you know, a, a feminist from Egypt who's very fond of profanity as a kind of transgression against the rules. So I think I think breaking the rules is great. And I think also something that's implicit in those statements about how women should speak is the question of who are women speaking to, or who are feminists, I should say, speaking to. And there's often a framework that we're trying to convince our enemies and the people who don't agree with us and oppose us. But I think that in some way, when we say shit is fucked up, we're trying, we're speaking to each other. And if we enjoy it, if it makes us feel powerful, then it's effective and useful and valuable speech. And uh, you're not for everyone and not everywhere, but some of the time. But I think the underlying question of, well, who are we speaking to who must we please? Because one of the things I notice constantly that's also very gendered is that progressive and left wing and female people are constantly being told that no matter what they need to please right wing and conservative and male people who are never told that they, you know, they shouldn't say that, think that, vote for that because it doesn't please the other side. So there's a deeply gendered asymmetry about who is supposed to please and protect and defer and grovel before whom. More broadly, the question of language, I th think of as a feminist deconstruction of sexist language. We do have one inflected thing in English, which is for people from Latin America and the Spanish speaking world. We had said Latino, which is masculine. And now we have this hard to pronounce Latinx, which is gender neutral and arguments about it. And, um, 
as well as a very funny person on Twitter who would insist that lots of female forms are gender neutral. Why can't everyone be called a firewoman? Why can't everyone be called a policewoman? But I think that, you know, that there's so many answers to that. It's such a huge, great question. Part of the power of language, feminist power of language is for whatever one says to be in conversation rather than trying to have the last word that leads to silence the kind of heroic speech of the individual who needs no one else. So there's a way there can, you know, to speak in questions that don't always need answers. I think there's ways of redefining things, coming up with new terms, which is what my talk was about, using words like marital rape and gaslighting and reproductive rights, mansplaining, DARVO, et cetera. I think there's also a generosity and inclusiveness of speech, which might be harder to define, but that, that's part of what I mean by questions and conversational that leaves room for other voices that invites other people to feel that their voices and ideas matter. Cause there is a kind of authoritarianism of language, which is I have said something so smart and right and true. All the rest of you can shut the fuck up versus I have said something I think is interesting and powerful, but perhaps you have something to add to it. That's not even necessarily a contradiction, but building on it or, rendering it more complex or challenging it. So I think it's about unending conversation, inclusion, horizontality, questioning and self-questioning. And though I strongly believe in being tough and powerful when necessary, I think also a kind of kindness that doesn't have to be confused with weakness or nice niceness ever, which are things constantly pushed on women uh, in which essentially is consent to unkindness. So, you know, a kindness that's respect, you know, that is what democracy requires of us to respect everyone and possibly respect everyone as potentially have something to say. And, uh, you know, so all those characteristics of speech, which I think we do see in effect, but I don't know if I've seen codified necessarily, which doesn't mean nobody has just means I haven't read it yet. And if that's the wrap up, I wanna thank all of you for coming with me on this exploration. Uh, thank the feminists of Poland and the queer rights activists of Poland, even the photographs. There's a photograph of a woman ra waving a rainbow flag in what looks like a police riot. Even the photographs have excited us so much in the United States. And I wish there was more coverage than there was, but I will be looking harder for it in the future. And I wish you huge feminist victories and uh, I'm so honored to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being with us and for sharing your thoughts, answering our questions and for the lecture. Agata, thank you for being uh, here with me today. Uh, and I also thanks, uh, thank uh, Ania Zdzieborska, Michał Badura and Zahenta team for uh, helping and organizing uh, this event. And um, what, what can I say? I think we should uh, see each other on the streets. I hope that time comes when, we, when this damn pandemic is over and we can travel. I am so overdue to come to Poland. You're invited. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our public. And I should just say this artwork is by Selena Perez, a disabled artist in the Bay Area uh, who works with a project called Creativity Explored. The, uh, the black swan that I love, that's my background for most Zoom artworks. So a feminist, a feminine work of art um, and a black swan, the powerful but rare things that happen. Thank you all so much. Thank you.